It's because fairies aren't f***ing real! Daddy, chill. Ah, there is nothing quite like a good hoax. Until it goes too far and people end up dying or people end up believing all sorts of crazy shit. Because there's like, you start a hoax, right? Or like someone starts a hoax. And they're like, no, no, it's just a hoax. But then a bunch of people who believed in the hoax still believe the hoax afterwards, even when the person said it was just a hoax. Because humans are really stupid. But before we get into any of that nonsense, I will just say that this video is brought to you by Magellan TV. You can check out Magellan TV and get a free trial. There's a link below. More on them in a bit. Welcome, welcome. If you're new to Business Plays, what happens is Danny will write me a script. That's what we have right here. I'm going to read it, make it a little bit more sh and then Sam is going to sprinkle in some of the finest of the vintage memes. Let's go! My dad used to own a bookshelf bending collection of 24 dusty old books that used to frighten the life out of me as a kid. Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Back in the 1970s, there had apparently been a very popular magazine called Man, Myth, and Magic, an illustrated encyclopedia of the supernatural. And later that decade, all 112 volumes were condensed into a lavish set of 24 books, which my dad had been gifted long before I was born. And he held on to like a family heirloom. <laughs> magazine quality material about magic and the supernatural. What a waste of time. <laughs> My opinion of the supernatural is so low. It's like anytime someone mentions it, yeah, it's ghosts. I'm like, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. And they're like, yeah, but how do you explain this? It's like, I can't. I can't explain it. But you know what it's not? Supernatural. It does have an explanation. I just don't know what it is yet. It's like, you've seen magic tricks, right? Like someone shows you a magic trick and you're like, you're not like, it's magic. You're like, yeah, there's an explanation. There's obvious an explanation. You just don't know what it is. It's like, no one's like David Copperfield is an actual wizard, are they? Are they? It's the same about Supernatural. Why is that so hard to understand? They feel your methods, your theories are... Spooky? Do you think I'm spooky? The books took a comprehensive look at witchcraft, demonology, astrology, and all kinds of other weird, mystical sh**, usually from an angle which suggested that all of this stuff was completely genuine. My brother and I weren't really allowed to look through the books, partly because of the deeply disturbing content and images, and partly because of the frequent nudity scratted liberally across the pages when the books were discussing ri witchcraft rituals or anything else which involved the protagonists getting their bits out in the name of Satan. I would say that this is the sort of thing that they'd print it be like, an interesting supernatural event, and you'd open it up and it would be like the Playboy anthology or whatever, you know, for dads everywhere before, I guess, computers came along. But then you'd just be like, a, a history of the world. Or like, Winston Churchill's involvement. Nah, that's too interesting. <laughs> Nerd! It'd be like some really boring part of history and then you'd open it up. But no, not this. But we did occasionally brush off the cobwebs and sneak a peek at the pages when nobody was looking. And it was always enough to give me nightmares for the whole week ahead. Come to think of it, the books even gave my dad nightmares. My mum once claimed that she'd been woken up in the middle of the night by the sound of him shrieking like a banshee after he'd fallen asleep reading a story in the books about a man who got turned into a cat by a witch. I can't look into the darkness with you anymore, Mulder. I cannot stand what it does to you or to me. I'm fine with it, Scully. I'm actually okay. What sort of adult man is reading these books? I don't mean to throw shade at your dad, Danny, but uh, it's a bit weird to, like, I mean, the last time I read a book about witches turning into cats, it was like Harry Potter or some shit. And I was like 11. And I know people are like, Harry Potter are books for adults, Simon. Yeah, but they're not, are they? <laughs> Go nuts in the comments, Potterophiles or whatever you're called. Potterheads? Potters? <laughs> Harry of the Potter. You! You foul and loathe them evil little cockroach! Hermione, no! And after hearing this, I started having nightmares about my dad having nightmares about being turned into a cat. These books were dangerous. But there was one particular set of photographs in the expansive volumes of Man, Myth and Magic which particularly fascinated me as a child. And perhaps surprisingly, they had nothing to do with ghosts or demons or naked witches or uh, a sacrificing bl a blood-stained goat to the Dark Lord Siroth. Oh, oh, oh. I should not lift my hands up like this. Uh, I'm still recovering from a broken collarbone and it itches like because I've still got the stitches in. Like my arm's feeling really good, but the stitches are so tight. There's like 13 of those mother all the way down here. Ah, oh, easy there, Blaze Boy, easy. In contrast, this set of five black and white photographs were quite innocent and charming and magical. They weren't magical, Danny. There's no such thing as magic. Oh, spoil sport whistlers, no such thing as magic. Ah. 
There's no such thing as Father Christmas Eve, kids. <laughs> Spoiler alert! I'm the cool dad. That's that's my thing. Taken in 1917, the black and white photographs depicted a couple of young girls posing at the bottom of an English country garden with some unlikely friends. Or maybe not that unlikely, because we all know what can be found at the bottom of the garden. Fairies. The story of the Cottingley Fairies is perhaps one of the most famous long-running hoaxes to have ever been pulled in the UK. I feel like I've vaguely heard of this. Fifty years after the photographs were first circulated, man, myth, and magic were still happy to conclude that the photographs were probably genuine. As in, as in all that time, nobody had been able to prove that they had been faked. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. Also, no one's going to man, myth, and magic for a reliable source. It'd be like, yeah, Paranormal Monthly. Oh my god, all of this must be real because it's in Paranormal Monthly. Unfortunately, Paranormal Mo Monthly is not a peer-reviewed journal, is it? Is it? IS IT?! And it had all just started as a little childhood prank which had spiralled completely out of control. During the last few days of the First World War, nine-year-old Frances Griffiths was staying at the family of her cousin, 16-year-old Elsie Wright. They both enjoyed playing at a stream at the bottom of the garden in their house in Cottingley near Bradford, West Yorkshire. But this didn't always go down well with Elsie's mother, as they often traipsed back into the house with clothes that were now piss wet through. The kids reckons that they only played by the stream to see the fairies, but Elsie's parents were somewhat dubious about this claim. Oh my god, this brings back childhood memories for me. I had a friend called Tim from, uh, this is a absolutely random tangent from primary school and he had a garden and at the edge of the at the end of this garden there was a stream and the craziest thing about this stream was like there was this big mud wall and it must have been some like garbage tip in the past because through this mud wall would emerge all this crazy shit. you'd be like reaching in there and you'd pull out like a bottle of like some pharmaceutical potion all of the uh like paper was missing and everything but you'd pull out like crazy glass bottles and shit every time would go to the maybe i'm over imagining this as an adult like you know you embellish your childhood memories but we'd just go down to the stream at the end of tim's garden and we'd pull up was it tim or was it peter it was peter um fascinating simon thank you for the clarification and we'd pull out this crazy shit and we'd be like whoa and uh in my childhood mind it was amazing maybe it wasn't as amazing as that maybe once we found like a piece of glass but like, I remember it being very cool. Thanks for the tangent, Simon. That was brilliant. Well done. This has absolutely nothing to do with the story. Why am I telling you this? I don't know. I don't know, man. So in a bid to prove that the Cottingley fairies were very much real, the kids borrowed Elsie's father's camera to take a few snapshots of the mythical winged beasties. Maybe they really were fairies at the bottom of their garden, but the notoriously publicity-shy creatures weren't coming out to play when they spotted the camera. So instead, the resourceful kids decided to just cut a few pictures of fairies from children's books and prop them up at the bottom of the garden with hairpins. Supernatural people are dumb. They're really dumb. <laughs> Uh, because anyone who's not a supernatural believer is just like those are obviously fake and the supernatural people are like, oh, the fairies! That's glorious! Proof at last! Idiots. Elsie's dad wasn't particularly impressed. In fact, after he developed the photographs, he banned the kids from ever using his precious camera again. But after but Elsie's mother was into that shit. Sam, cue the meme! No. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit! Unlike her skeptical husband, she believed that the fairies were real. She probably would have been an avid reader of man, myth, and magic if it had been around back then. After she passed the photographs around theosophical circles, they eventually landed in the lap of one high-profile psycho who was about to push the story into the realm that the mischievous kids could never have imagined. And that sucker was Arthur Conan Doyle. And I think he famously had, didn't he do something with Harry Houdini? And it was like, his wife was like some medium. And it was like, Harry, Harry, mate, you gotta check out my wife. She's gonna be able to communicate with your dead mother or whatever from beyond the grave and harry houdini was like all right though, that sounds pretty fun let's give it a go shall we because i don't think harry houdini unsurprisingly didn't believe in any of this shit. arthur conan doll was mad into it and then arthur conan doll's wife was like oh, she's telling me this she says that she misses you and harry houdini is like mate my mother doesn't speak english <laughs> legend Listen here, Hagrid, I'm just Harry. But before we get into more about that legendary story, actually we won't because I just off the cuffed it, we'll actually get into some facts. Uh, let me tell you very quickly about today's glorious sponsor, Magellan TV. Uh, Magellan TV is basically, it's a Netflix for big brains. That's not their marketing material. That's what I came up with them. And look, Magellan, if you want to change it, so when people go to trymagellantv.com forward slash business plays, and it says at the top, Netflix for big brains, and use my idea, you absolutely can, you probably won't. It'd be a bit weird. 
But uh, you can. Oh, my uh, genius knows no bounds. As Jeremy Clarkson likes this, there's a brilliant compilation of him just saying, my genius knows no bounds on YouTube about all his crazy ideas. I watched it the other day. Mwah! So yeah, Magellan TV is Netflix for big brains. They have all sorts of documentaries on there. Did I come up with one to recommend? Yes, I did! The Shroud of Turin, you know that thing with Jesus' face on? They've got a documentary about it, and it's like, real or fake? And look, and look, I'm not gonna spoil the end. I'm not gonna spoil the end, except I am. It's not real, is it? It's not real. Watch the documentary. It's, uh, I have a, I'm gonna, I was gonna say it's a good one, but I haven't actually seen that one. I just looked at the synopsis because I had to, I wanted to come up with something related to hoaxes and I didn't have time to watch it. But look, I've watched a bunch of other stuff on Magellan and it's really good. So the odds are it's gonna be really good. Just a bit of transparency there. Uh, or you could just watch anything else on that platform. Yeah, so does that. You guys can get a one month free trial with Magellan, so you can even try it for free. Ah, brilliant. Uh, just click in the link in the description below. It's content for days and days. So let Magellan hook you up. You'll be absolutely, gloriously, wonderfully, supernaturally glad that you did. And, uh, yeah. So do that. Why not? It also helps support the show. Thank you, Magellan. It's perhaps unfair to say that the creator of... Oh, yeah, Arthur Conan Doyle. Fairies. Like that. It's perhaps unfair to say that the creator of Sherlock Holmes was completely hoodwinked by the photographs. He certainly had an unusually strong interest in fairies and very probably believed in them like an idiot. It's funny how Arthur Conan Doyle creates Sherlock Holmes, who in your mind will be the first guy to be like, that shit can fuck right off. Not, not the Sherlock Holmes spirit. Oh dear Watson, my old chap, there's absolutely no way that those fairies are real, are they, old bean? And then he does the thing with his hat or some such. I don't know, he probably hits his opium pipe, doesn't he? Legend. But it may also have been the case that these photographs just provided him with a strong hook for an article on fairies that he had been commissioned to write for Strand Magazine, the original home of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And sure enough, when the article went to print in December of 1920, a headline on the top of the cover screamed out, Fairies photographed an epoch-making event described by A. Conan Doyle. <laughs> described, except he wasn't there. He just saw a photograph that some kids faked with cuttings from books. Holy sh**, guys, really? The past was the worst. Selling out in days, this little childhood prank had snowballed into a global sensation, and now the two girls had been cornered into a position where they had to keep to sticking to their original stories. It was too late to admit that they'd just been mucking about. In fact, they managed to stick to their story for the next 66 years. Ah, oh, you dug yourself in and you're like, it, it was all real. <laughs> Imagine being like a 54-year-old, being like, were you the girl when he was a kid who saw the fairies? Be like, yes, absolutely, I was. Where the fairies were real. At some point, just be like, no, it wasn't real. It wasn't real, I made it up. You're a kid, it's okay, no one gives a So that was a fucking lie. Of course, not everyone believed that the photographs were real over all that time. For every man or woman who believed that the fairies live at the bottom of the garden, there was another man or woman who felt that this was clearly just a crock of fairy They didn't believe it was a crock of fairy Annie, they just believed it was a crock of because fairies aren't f***ing real! Daddy, chill. Looking at the photographs now, they're all imbued with a certain enchanting quality. But it's hard to see how anyone in their right minds could have taken them seriously. In one of the photographs, Elsie's hand is weirdly elongated to the point where she looks a bit like E.T. This was never satisfactorily explained, and it's unlikely that the two girls had been dabbling with pre photoshop visual effects. It's probably slightly easy to explain why all the fairies, dressed in the very latest French fashions, look distinctly two-dimensional and propped up. Perhaps by hairpins. Quite incredibly, it wasn't until 1978 that somebody noticed a compelling clue as to the true origins of the Cottingley Fairies. The popular magician James Randi, and absolute mega legend, R.I.P. James, spotted that the fairies in the photograph looked remarkably similar to a set of illustrations which had appeared in the children's book Princess Mary's Gift Book. Well, James, it's obvious that the person who drew that, drew that book drew the real life fairies. Dearney James, you idiot! Not really, James. R.I.P. you legend. Uh, first published in 1915, a couple of years before the images were taken. Eventually, Elsie and Francis owned up to the hoax in a 1983 interview with The Unexplained magazine. By this time, the pair were quite elderly and neither of them would live to see the end of the decade. They probably figured that they'd gone way past the point where they might get in trouble with Elsie's dad for pissing about with his camera and lying about the results for years. <laughs> it's like, it's okay, guys, it's okay. It's all right, don't worry about it, no one minds. And James Randi's extremely satisfied. Curiously, though, the younger Francis still maintained that she really could see fairies, and that the fifth photograph, the weirdest of the bunch, a blurry and surreal depiction of fairies in their sunbath, was genuine. Why? I don't. Now it's now it's like why are you sticking to part of the lie? Don't get it. 
you're just misremembering, I think. Meanwhile, Elsie revealed that she never thought anyone would take such an interest in the photographs, as she felt it was blindingly obvious that they were fakes. <laughs> but don't, don't underestimate humans' love of being uh, of self-deception. If Arthur Conan Doyle had never caught a glimpse of the pictures, it's likely that the silly childhood game would have been quietly forgotten by the family instead of firing the imagination of fairy lovers for over six, six decades. Even the simplest of hoaxes can take flight in an unexpected way with a, and gather surprising momentum, which will take them well beyond the bottom of the garden. Balloon Boy. On October the 15th, 2009, millions of viewers watched the rolling news coverage of a homemade helium balloon floating across the skies of Colorado. I feel like I know this one. Where the people were like, yeah, yeah, there's a boy he's attached to it, but he wasn't really. And it just went too far. And I People go in trouble for this, right? There are a couple of unusual things about the balloon. For starters, it was shaped a bit like a UFO. But more importantly, there was apparently a six-year-old boy trapped inside the balloon. <laughs> What's he doing inside the balloon? <laughs> Which was now reaching 7,000 feet as it drifted aimlessly across Colorado, seemingly in no hurry to return to the safety of the Earth. Parents Richard and Mayumi... Mayumi? Mayumi, Heen told the authorities that they'd released the flying saucer balloon from their home, fort, home in Fort Collins, largely for a bit of a laugh. But it was only after the balloon had taken to the skies that they suddenly realized one of their kids, six-year-old Falcon, had mysteriously disappeared from the fun family scene. The frantic parents called 911 as soon as they figured out that the poor Falcon had almost uh, certainly climbed inside the helium balloon when they weren't. How do you climb in? I guess it's not. I'm imagining a balloon with like, you know, the and it's got the tiny en entrance. And even if it was big, it's going to be really hard to get in there. But I guess these giant balloons are slightly different. I mean, they must be. But it's not real. So what? Stop dissecting this whistle boy and just get on with it. Come on. And I was heading in the rough direction of Denver International Airport. Uh-oh. Over the course of 90 horrifying minutes, the news cameras followed the heart-stopping journey of Balloon Boy as National Guard head helicopters and local police tracked the homemade flying saucer and the Federal Aviation Administration suspended departures from Denver Airport in a bid to avoid a nasty collision on live TV. After traveling for over 50 miles, the balloon eventually came down to land about 12 miles from the airport, but there was no sign of Falcon. However, following reports that an object had been spotted falling from the balloon whilst it was still in flight, a grim land search was carried out to try and find Falcon's remains. Dude, this is so... Th this must be so expensive. There must be so much money wasted. Like, grounding flights, people not going places. Not just the immediate cost, but like the lost co economy of it. It's like, I don't get it. It's like here, where I live in, in, in Prague in the Czech Republic, like, they don't have this rule where it's like, or they have this rule, where if you're in a car accident, you have to leave everything exactly where it was until the police arrive so they can, like, take photographs for the insurance companies and stuff. And it's like, it makes no sense. It's like, if you're, and like, for a super minor accident, say you, someone rear-ends you, and it's very minor, but your car's a bit up, so you need to get it repaired. Both cars absolutely roadworthy, could continue driving. And it's like, you leave them exactly where they are. And it causes a huge tailback. And I'm always like, the economic cost of this is so insane because people are trying to get to work to earn money and all of this stuff. And it's just people just sitting in their cars waiting for this to be clear. So I'm like, just take a photo and drive them to the side of the road. <laughs> it's crazy. The economic benefit or like of working this out is so low compared to the economic cost of the huge traffic jam you're creating. I just don't get it. I just don't get if it's what's that phrase if it steers it clears just do it stupid law but there was no need to worry the cheeky little scamp had never climbed inside the balloon after all he was later found in the attic of the family home where he'd been hiding all along for shits and giggles or had he during the media circus that enveloped the family over the following days, parents Richard and Mayumi appeared to be appeared with Falcon on Larry King Live, where they were interviewed by Wolf Blitzer, who naturally asked the kid the obvious question, what in the name of arse had he been playing at? Wolf Blitzer. I don't know. I, I feel like I know he is, because wasn't he in a Mission Impossible movie? Um, it's such a great name, though. Wolf as a name and Blitzer as a surname? In response, Falcon looked at his parents in a mild state of confusion and mumbled, You guys said we did this for the show. Uh-oh. The very next morning, when the family were being interviewed on NBC's Today and ABC's Good Morning America, Falcon was asked the question, and this time he responded by simply vomiting live on both occasions. Oh my god. 
Oh shit, I'm sorry. Here's the thing, Richard and Miami had already, already tasted a brief sip of celebrity stardom when they appeared in the infamous reality TV show Wife Swap a few years earlier. In fact, their appearance had gone down so well with fans that they had been invited back to participate in the show's 100th anniversary episode. But after their 50 minutes of fame were up, they were keen to get back in the limelight with their own reality TV show. The only problem was that none of the TV networks seemed remotely interested in commissioning such a thing. These days, wait, when was this? 2000 and something? 2009. YouTube was around, but I guess there weren't these like family prank channels or whatever. It's so f***ing insufferable. Like, do you know, YouTube's so huge, you'll like discover a whole new genre of YouTube just by like some random recommendation or something. You're like, whoa, 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 there's a YouTuber here is like 30 million subscribers and millions of views on each channel, on each video. And all they seem to do is fake pranks on their kids. It seems a bit exploitative and weird. And it's like, what the f*** is this? It's so clearly fake and it's so cringe, but it's so popular. And you're like, what is going on, YouTube? It's so crazy that this exists. Anyway, this is what these people could do, but uh, I, I don't think people would watch them. They're probably too boring, allegedly. So this whole deflating saga, but a bum I, I would do the, the ba ba but my shoulder, still painful. You're a coward, you know that? Uh, to get back into the press and persuade the TV networks that Richard and Miami were hot property and not just washed up has-beens from wife swap. After being found guilty of misdemeanor and felony charges, including filing a false report with authorities, oh wow, so you actually reported it to the police? That is irresponsible and... Oh, that, I mean, if it was just a prank and other people picked up on it and you were like, oh, I never said anything, I never called the police, people just assumed, then it's like, okay, What's that called? Is it plausible deniability or something? But if it's like, yo, 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 you reported a fake crime to the police. <laughs> now you're going to get in bigger trouble, folks. Come on. Uh, Miami was sentenced to 20 weekend days in jail. So she had to spend 10 weekends in jail. That is so bizarre. Well, <laughs> what are you doing this weekend? Gotta go to jail again. <laughs> Weird. Great way to save money, by the way. Uh, while well, Richard was sentenced to 60 days. Both parents were also sentenced to four years probation, over 100 hours of community service each, in order to pay a total of $36,000 in restitution. See, in that case, why I don't understand like sending people to prison for 60 days or 20 weekends. Or 20 weekend days, 10 weekends. In that case, I mean, surely community service is a way better option. Because it's like, it's gonna be less fun. You're actually gonna be doing something useful for the community, like removing graffiti or picking up litter. Why not just give a way harsher community service sentence? I don't understand. That just seems like better all round. Is jail really that off-putting for like, I guess, I guess. But I just genuinely wonder whether I do just like 20 weekends in jail or like weeks of community service picking up trash. It, you know, I'd rather pick up trash. I guess that's the point because it's like I'd rather be doing something I'd rather be like even if it's, I'm not getting paid for it uh, I'm just like doing it. I'd much rather be removing graffiti than just sitting my ass Even if the ass was comfortable I, If someone said you just have to sit in this room and do nothing all day and just you know a little bit of light raping in the showers I'll be like That sounds horrible it, Even if it was just sitting in a room and there was no raping I'd be like yeah, I'd just rather go pick up trash. I really would. I really would. I just spent three days in hospital with this, and all I had to do was like watch Netflix, and I was just not up to doing any sort of work or anything, and it was just it was so boring. I'm just like, uh, if someone said, "We'll let you go out and pick up trash," I'd be like, F "In, I'm in. I'm absolutely a hundred percent in." <laughs> Frank, what the hell are you doing, man? Uh, it's my character. I'm the trash man. Why, this is the longest aside ever. Stop it. In order to pay $36,000 in restitution, Young Falcon went on to form a heavy metal band when he got older, and the band's most notable tracks was a little, little bouncy ditty called Balloon Boy No Hoax, except it was a hoax. The parents later protested their innocence and claimed that they had only confessed to the crime because the authorities were threatening the Japan-born Miami with deportation if they didn't play ball. And quite staggeringly, in 2020, they were pardoned by Governor Jared Polis on the grounds that they had already paid the price in the eyes of the public and it was time for Colorado to move on. Let's not worry about the fact that the costs of the pointless rescue operation were estimated to be in the region of $2 million. Uh, Danny seems outraged by this pardon. However, I don't think I am. I think these people, you know, they made a mistake. They deserve to be forgiven over a period of time. And I don't know how it works exactly in America, but if you're a convict, right, and you were in jail for a period of time, that's going to make it way harder for you to get a good job and all of this stuff. And it's probably going to f*** your whole life up. So I'm like, if they're pardons, then they don't have to say, like, I'm a convict when they apply for a job and they can probably get on with their life. Who are they going to hurt? They probably really did learn their lesson, and I think that's a good thing. I think, like, is that so outrageous? 
Let's forgive them and move on. Good for you, uh, Jared, in this case. Richard and Miami could, and it's like, okay, great. If they've got if they've got better jobs, they're going to be paying more taxes, which will help pay off that two million dollars. Right? Good. Richard and Miami should perhaps just have been a little more patient in their quest for fame. A former producer of Wife, Sw Wife uh, Swap later revealed that they had been genuinely interested in developing a new reality show with the pair, but the fallout from the Balloon Boy saga put a pin in those preliminary plans. I'll have to say, like interest from producers is like the biggest like hollywood bullshit in the world like i've had plenty of things where it's like there's interest in producers would you like to do this would you like to do that fact boy we'd love you to do this with us and then it's like it drags on there's phone calls and then nothing ever happens because i don't know what's wrong with producers it's like when i decide to do something i do it producers are always like oh yeah well actually we had a change of direction with this we didn't get the funding from that someone said no so why are you wasting my time And now, nowadays, when so I get some cool email about something being like, we'd love you to do this or work with that, I'm like, all right, I just have no excitement for it. I'm just like, well, let's see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, why not? Just see how it goes and then get in touch when, like, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my time with that many phone calls about it. And also, like, nowadays, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want, like, a TV show, for example. It's like, okay, well, you got to go do this. And then it's like, you got to do, like, 21 days of shooting. I can't say, I can't take 21 days off work. And it's like, how much are you paying me? And they were like, well, you know, we need to discuss it with this. And it's like, and then it comes, comes back and I'm like, wait, how much do you think I make? <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. It's like a month off work. Are you fucking crazy? Throughout the night, I'd be like, oh yeah, but it's exposure on television. I'm like, television. Brilliant. Well, that's the future. Uh, the Education of Little Tree. Throughout the 1980s, there was a charming little book which could often be found on the school reading list all over America. First published in 1976 to very little fanfare, the true story of The Education of Little Tree has proven to be something of a slow burner. I've never heard of this. Written by Forrest, although I'm really enjoying now, like, going through, uh, children's books. Because my kids, uh, 19, 20 months old now. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they enjoy reading these books with you and you open up the book and they get all excited and they make these strange reactions to parts and you're like, I don't understand why you react this way. Whenever, like, something, there's a part of a book where someone comes out from behind a doghouse or something and goes, woo! And every time we get to this page, my kid sitting in my lap just turns around, it's the sweetest thing in the world, and just turns around, faces me, and gives me the biggest smile in the world. And I just like, I don't know why you find this so amusing, but it's brilliant. And so, yeah, you have the same kid, kid, uh, books that you had as a kid. So, what have we got? We got like the Very Hungry Caterpillar and all of this. Shit. I love it. It's so sweet. Written by Forrest Carter, the book was a uh, autobiographical account, uh, autobiographical account of the author's useful, youthful experiences growing up in the Tennessee Hills with his Cherokee grandparents who guided Forrest towards a path of pan-tribal Indian spirituality and embedded a deep respect for nature into the little boy's soul. This all sounds brilliant. Although it took a while to gather steam, the education of Little Tree became. Oh wait, none of it's real, is it? It's all going to be fake. He's going to be just some like random white dude. <laughs> Uh, became so popular for its rich insight into the simple living of the Cherokee people, its captivating Native American themes, and uplifting story strands, and the so-called strong and the strong eco message at the very heart of the book. And it wasn't to be Forrest Carter's only dip into literary success. A few years earlier, in 1972, he had penned his debut novel, 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 novel. God damn the rebel outlaw Josie Wales, which in 1976 was adapted into the critically acclaimed movie The Outlaw Josie Wales, uh, directed by and starring Clint Eastwood. Forrest Carter went strangely quiet from 1979 onwards, which was a bit of a shame as the education of Little Tree only grew in popularity, entering the New York Times bestseller list for the first time in 1991. Oh, that's a slow burn. It's like, yeah, I wrote a book in 1976 and now it's a bestseller, like 15 years later. That's pretty cool. And it was for this. And this was the very same year that history professor Dan T. Carter, no relation to the author, documented a shocking revelation in the pages of the New York Times. Forrest Carter had never existed. This was just a pseudonym for the real author, Asa Earl Carter, who had died in 1979, hence the subsequent quiet period. And by the way, Asa Earl Carter had no roots with the Cherokee people. In fact, he was a white supremacist. No, he wasn't. A rabid segregationist and a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh my god, this is complicated, isn't it? During the 1950s, Carter had formed his own KKK splinter group, uh, which went under the name of the original Ku Klux Klan of the Confederacy. You just had to throw some Confederacy in there, didn't you? An original probably meant more racist. 
Although I don't think the Ku Klux Klan became less racist over time, did they? I don't know. Don't care. The jolly band of Bell Ends has been responsible for assaulting the singer Nat King Cole on stage in Birmingham, beating up a civil rights activist and stabbing his wife, and castrating a black handyman and leave him leaving him for dead. Holy sh**, my dude. Carter left the group in 1958 after shooting two of his associates in a petty squabble over finances, although charges of attempted murder were mysteriously dropped. Probably because they were like, I did us a favor, didn't you? <laughs> you might be a racist, but at least you killed two more of them. He's like, yeah, 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 go back, go have some more squabbles, kill some more of your fellow racists. Maybe the guy who castrated the dude, just pop him off. Come on, get back to it, Carter. Carter? Yes, Carter. So this left Carter free to take up the new role of speechwriter for the 45th governor of Alabama and notorious segregationist George Wallace in the 1960s. <laughs> George Wallace before, this is made up, but he wasn't a segregationist at all. He wasn't even a racist. And then he hired this guy and he was like, he's just reading these speeches like, I'm Ron Burgundy. And he's like, George, why did you become such a racist? I don't know, mate. I just read the speeches, okay? That's all I do. I don't have a platform. I just read other people's words, like fact boy. Although, if I ever become racist, Danny's the Danny. Danny's the real racist. We all know that. Not really, Danny. I'm sorry. Oh shit. I'm sorry. Although Carter was naturally never officially credited for any of the speeches he composed for Wallace, he almost certainly came up with one of the politician's most famous slogans made during his inaugural speech in 1963: "Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever." It's a bit short-sighted, isn't it? It's not really going to last that long. Uh, so why exactly had a white supremacist turned his hand to pretending that he grew up in a Cherokee tribe? F*** knows. That's what Danny wrote. It's been speculated by readers who still enjoy the soul-stirring stories of the education of Little Tree that the book was a guilt-ridden atonement for his appalling behavior and beliefs in the past. This sounds a little bit hard to swallow, though Carter went on to live a troubled and violent life through the 1970s, and it's reported that he died from his injuries after getting into a drunken ball in Texas with his own son. <laughs> Dude, what are you up to? That is fucking disgusting. It could just be that he was enjoying taking the piss and pulling the wool over the eyes of readers and schools who thought that they were learning from an authentic account of, Native, of, an, of an authentic account of Native American life. Others have suggested that the narrative hides a white supremacist subtext, which conveniently, conveniently glosses over much of the real history of the South and depicts the Cherokee tribe as living a carefree and untroubled life. The book later came under fire from members of the Cherokee Nation, who pointed down that the inaccuracies and terrible stereotypes depicted in the pages. Whatever the truth, the book was swiftly declassified from true story to fiction and largely vanished from the school reading lists. But not everyone appeared to get the memo. Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> okay, hello. I was happy to promote this very spiritual book in 1994, and it continued to appear on our website list of recommended titles until as late as 2007, before Oprah announced that it was time to take it off the shelf. Oprah, you're a little bit behind the, wall, the, 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 the curve on this one. And surprisingly, it was even adapted into a movie with a limited theatrical release in 1997. In fact, the book is still available to buy today, and the exposure of the hoax doesn't appear to have harmed sales too much. I do wonder how many new copies they'd shift if the publishers bothered to update the about the author section at the back, though. <laughs> Maybe like written by a KKK member, Carter, or whatever his name was. Uh, his, his crew he formed a splinter group of the KKK, and cast, who castrated a black dude. You want to buy the book? It's like just a picture of him in his like weird KKK costume. No, like, what's up? Scratching Fanny down at Cock Lane. During the middle of the 18th century, every wise Londoner knew that it was best to avoid walking down Cock Lane at night. During medieval times, the snappily named uh, small road in Smithfield, just a few minutes stroll from St Paul's Cathedral, had uh, been a notorious hotspot for legal brothels. But <laughs> yeah, never walk down that street tonight unless unless you're looking for a brothel. <laughs> Uh, by the Georgian era, Cock Lane had become more famous for its ghosts. In particular, scratches and knocks and ghostly apparitions were regularly observed at the modest dwelling at 25 Cock Lane, except they weren't, because they're not real. And if there were scratchings and knockings, it, would pe it was people or animals, not ghosts, okay? Zoinks! It's the gay blade! Things reached ahead in 1762 when the ghost of Cock Lane, after seemingly taking a holiday for a while, returned with a vengeance. Now she was nosier than ever before, and this time she was scratching Fanny. Oh my. Fanny uh, is, a, is a British slang for something. The property belonged at the time to the parish clerk Richard Parsons, a semi-respected figure in the community, but also an infamous drunk. <laughs> semi-respected. I feel like it's, the, it's like backhanded compliment. You're semi-respected. There's things we respect about you, but also things we don't respect. 
His most recent lodger, Catherine Friends, just fled the house after finding she was unable to cope with the constant eerie scratching and knocking and wailing noises. And this left Parsons with just his wife and 11-year-old daughter Elizabeth to cope with the haunting by themselves. But it appears that Elizabeth had something of a gift when it came to communicating with the spirit world. It was alleged that she was the only member of the family who could actually see and talk to the ghost rather than just put up with the annoying noises. And over the course of several increasingly public seances, the Parsons family were able to use Elizabeth to ascertain the identity of the ghost who felt very much at home. A 25 Cock Lane. It turns about to be the ghostly spirit of another Parsons former lodger by the name of Fanny. She had only died very recently, but was now keen to set the record straight on the circumstances of her tragically young death. Fanny had first moved into Cock Lane with her new partner, a loan shark by the name of William Kent. This had proven to be good news for Parsons, who was a bit strapped for cash after blowing all of his money on booze. Holy shit. I mean, I know people don't, you know, he, maybe he's not the richest man in the world, but if you're just buying, like, cheap liquor from the zoo, is it, is it, it must be quite hard to spend all your money on booze. Like, to be, why are you out of money? Nah, Simon, you're being a, you, you check your privilege, because there's drunk people and they do spend all their money on booze, which is sad. That's, that's not good. Let's move on. Not only did he have two new lodgers, but Lone Shark Kent also generously agreed to pay Len Parson the sum of 12 guineas to help tide him over. Repayable at just one guinea per month. But the relationship between Kent and Fanny would have raised more than a few eyebrows at the time. Although they liked to go under the name of Mr. and Mrs. Kent, they would never have been permitted to marry under the strict canon law of the age, because Mr. Kent had previously been married to Fanny's sister who had died during childbirth. Wait, isn't there something in the Bible about that? Like, if you're, the woman dies, you're, you're, the brother is obliged to marry or something? Like, the Bible is weird, and I have a feeling that's in there. Fanny's family weren't particularly happy about Kent running away with his deceased wife's sister so soon after the tragedy, and neither Kent nor Fanny were killed, keen to spill the beans on the details of their relationship. But Kent took the decision to confide in Parsons that they were not legally married, and in return, the drunk parish clerk now felt that he had some dirt on Kent, and so decided to booze away his guinea every month instead of paying it back. Uh-oh, don't give people you lend money to blackmail material. Loan Sharking 101. You're welcome, Loan Sharks. Mr. and Mrs. Kent moved into different lodgings, and a while later, Fanny fell gravely ill and eventually succumbed to smallpox, or at least that was the story at the time. Now scratching Fanny was back in Cock Lane, and alongside all the shrieking and wailing and scratching, she had a message to convey to Elizabeth Parsons. She hadn't died of smallpox at all. She had been the victim of arsenic poisoning, poisoning at the hand of her partner, William Kent. This is very elaborate. That's not going to stand up in court. Although maybe it did in the 1700s, because as we've discussed previously, the past was the worst. Jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the ghost has told us that he is guilty. Guilty, I say! Hang him! And they hang him. The past was the worst. I don't think that's what's gonna happen, though. You ready to fucking die? Oh, no, yeah, I'm a bad bitch. You can't kill me. The Parsons had developed a way to communicate with the ghost of Cock Lane, and this soon turned into something of a public spectacle. Elizabeth would lie on her bed in darkness, apparently possessed by the spirit of Fanny, while the rest of the family used a knocking system to get answers out of the ghost. After every question posed by the Parsons, Fanny would respond with one knock for yes and two knocks for no. It's a mystery how the Parsons eventually used the system to build up to the killer question, were you poisoned by arsenic by William Kent? Well, it's not that complicated. How did you die? Was it murder? Da da. Yes. Uh, were you strangled? Duh. No. Were you poisoned? Duh, duh. Yes. Who were you poisoned? Was your was the poisoner someone close to you? Buh, buh. Yes. Was it your husband? Buh, buh. Okay, done. Easy. Not that it's not 20 questions, is it, Danny? But after they'd reached this point, the story quickly gathered steam and the press as Cock Lane briefly turned into a circus and became impossible to pass through. One notable figure who made it inside the house to witness the visitation firsthand was none other than the legendary lexicographer. Lexicographer, baby, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who compiled the original dictionary, much like the Bible, an absorbing piece of work, but possibly in need of a tighter edit. The Daily Mail reported that Prince Edward, Duke of York, and Albany also paid a visit to Cock Lane, but the ghost was sadly busy on that day and didn't come out to play. By this time, the reputation of William Kemp was in tatters. Really? He strenuously denied the ghostly allegations and even went as far to request an exhumation of Fanny's body to prove that, uh, prove to everyone that the decomposing, to prove to everyone. <laughs> so that everyone could view the decomposing corpse for themselves. But the mystery of the Cock Lane ghost was finally exposed to just a load of 18th century cobblers when it was observed that Elizabeth had been making the knocking noises herself using pieces of wood hidden beneath her clothes. <laughs> of course she had. No one thought to check for that at all. Brilliant. Well done, 17th. Well done, 18th century. 
At one point, she forgot to tool up with wood and had been spotted by investigators sneaking out of the room to stock up. Not the most elaborate prank in the world, but it fooled the people of London for several weeks as everyone was thick as two short planks in the 18th century. Danny and I, same page. So that was a fucking lie. The whole hoax had been orchestrated by Richard Parsons as a way of exacting his revenge on William Kent. You see, Kent may have been a loan shark, but he wasn't the kind of loan shark who came round to break your knuckles if you didn't cough up. He just took you to court and sued you. Wait, isn't that just a lender then? <laughs> he done this. He'd done this before in the past and had successfully sued Parsons when the parish clerk had stopped repaying his guinea a month. But Parsons' misguided attempt at getting back at Kent didn't end well, and it's difficult to see exactly what he was trying to achieve, as Kent was unlikely to be charged with murder on the witness testimony of a ghost. Parsons and several other co-conspirators were brought to trial for a conspiracy to take away William Kent's life by charging him with murder. Parsons was sentenced to two years in prison, good, and was also ordered to stand in the public docked three times. Good, although the public largely took pity on him and even went around making collections for the disgraced parish clerk. Really? This guy tells a good story then, doesn't he? Cock Lane was finally demolished in 1979, but some say that scratching Fanny still haunts the new office box, proudly erected on Harry Balsack Avenue. <laughs> but up on bunch. Or that might just be another hairy fairy tale. It is indeed. This video has been Business Plays, brought to you by Magellan TV. Thank you everybody for watching. Support the show with Magellan. I'll see you next time. Go nuts in the comments, Potterophiles, or whatever you're called. Potterheads? Potters? <laughs> Harry of the Potter!